Good evening, um, and welcome to our First Wednesday series. And uh, <laughs> Wow, I haven't even talked yet. Just think what the applause will be like when they're done. Uh, my name is Peter Creva. I'm the CEO and President of the, of the Aquarium. I'm glad to see this is a really great turnout, and it just, uh, it's really encouraging. It tells me how many people care about these animals, which is pretty cool. Um, what I want to say is I want to acknowledge our sponsors, which is the, uh, the Stephen Brenda Olson, the uh, Courtyard by Marriott, and then Long Beach Container Terminal, which has a, uh, has a uh, table out there to pick up some material. And I'm told that this morning a number of employees from the Long Beach Container Terminal are out at the San Gabriel site where we do some monitoring and help cleaning up trash. So that only to give us financial support, they do um, on the ground or in the water work. And so tonight we're going to learn about sea turtles. I don't want to say too much because I um, just, just to introduce the speakers, it's Dr. Kelly Turner and Andrew Maurer. Um, they're going to do it as, as a tag team, pass the baton, but I'm going to introduce them both here. So Kelly got her PhD from UC San Diego um, and works for NOAA at the, uh, at the Southwest Fishery Science Center. And Andrew got his PhD from NC State and also uh, yeah, works for NOAA at the Southwest Fishery Science Center. And I'm not going to read all your fancy stuff because people would rather hear you talk about what you do, not about what you've done. But I will say, uh, just as, as a point, I notice there's a lot of uh, young folks out here, and you may be thinking of careers. Um, two of my favorite jobs are the aquarium and working for NOAA. I worked for NOAA for five years, and it's a wonderful organization. The scientists there are not um, plagued with ego. It's all about solving problems and collaboration. So welcome, Kelly, and you get the first shot, and then um, Andrew. Thank you, PK. All right, well, good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much to the Aquarium of the Pacific for inviting Andy and I to come here and talk about some of my favorite animals. I'm obviously biased, um, but bringing it full loop, I actually used to work in an aquarium. I worked at, in Manhattan Beach, just up the road at the uh, Roundhouse Aquarium, and that was where I kind of literally dipped my toe into the water of sea turtle research. So. Jumping right in, as you heard, we work with NOAA. NOAA is a big agency, studies everything from space down into the oceans. Within NOAA, we're part of the uh, fisheries division. And within fisheries, we're a part of the group that studies protected resources. So marine mammals, sea turtles fall under this category. And at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center, we're part of the Marine Turtle Ecology and Assessment Program. Now, as you can guess, we study sea turtles. So there are seven different species of sea turtles out there in the world. Five of them actually visit the waters here off of the California coast. Uh, the hawksbill doesn't come by too much, so I'm not gonna talk about that one much more, but I will talk about the other four in a moment here. The two turtle species that we don't get here are the flatback species. You have to go to Australia to see those. And then the Kemp's Ridleys are more common in the Gulf of Mexico and on the Northwest Atlantic. So coming back here to the West Coast, this is just to kind of give you an idea of the areas that um, here at NOAA Fisheries, where we're studying and thinking about turtles and what fisheries they're interacting with. The swordfish fishery is one of the main ones that we um, help to study and inform as part of our work. You can see a couple different specific conservation areas up in the north, that's to protect the leatherbacks. It has like a two month closure period that's happening right now just to mitigate the bycatch that might occur when the turtles are out there. Down here in the south, there's the Pacific uh, loggerhead conservation area. This one gets kicked in when there are certain warm water conditions, again, just to minimize the bycatch if the turtles in the area. Down in the bottom, down in Southern California there, you see a couple of those green triangles. Those are kind of these urban use management areas that we have to be aware of, and it's typically the green turtles that will come in near to the coast for us to, to visit and to see. So within the Marine Turtle Ecology and Assessment Program, this is just kind of a running list of the things that we're studying for these turtles. So population abundance and trends. We're looking at their migration patterns and habitat use, what they eat, how healthy they are, looking at contaminants, again, especially in these more urban neighborhoods that they're hanging out in. Demography is a big thing. A lot of my research focuses on demography, so that's age structure, uh, sex ratios, um, age at maturity, things like that. 
Bycatch reduction is obviously a big thing, again, being part of NOAA Fisheries, and then a lot of community engagement and community science. We use a lot of methods when we're out there trying to study and capture these turtles. We get on the water, we set nets, pull those turtles into the boats. If you look closely, there's actually four turtles in that boat with us there. Once we get them up on the shore, we bring them to our field station, we weigh them, measure them, tag them, collect blood samples, skin samples for genetics and diet studies. Some of the turtles get different tags. We give them all flipper tags. They get pit tags inside, just like a microchip you might have for your dog. We also give them satellite transmitters. This lets us know where those animals are moving and going after we set them back into the water. We also try to use different tools. So aerial surveys can be a really helpful way, whether that's from a plane. We're also starting to incorporate more work using drones. And this, again, gives us an idea of their spatial distribution. So where in these areas can you find these turtles? We also get a lot of information from taking stranding, or sorry, taking samples and studying animals that have dead stranded. A lot of my work actually relies on samples that are collected only from dead turtles. So it's an unfortunate thing when it happens, but I'm grateful we can still learn more about the animals after the fact they've died. The sample that I use for a lot of my work is the humerus bone found here, and I apply a couple different techniques. One is called skeletochronology. It's just a fancy way of saying we age the turtles by using those bones. And then I can combine that with a bunch of different techniques in the lab, uh, various types of chemical analysis or genetic analysis to answer these questions about age, growth, um, movement between different habitats and things like that. So skeletal chronology, just real briefly, again, we're using the humerus bone found in the upper flipper of the turtles there. In the lab, then I cut a small section of the bone shown right here. And then when I process it in the lab, you get an image like this. And just the way that a tree grows in those annual rings, it's the same thing for these hard-shelled species of sea turtles. And when I identify where those annual growth layers are, we can then start to build a multi-year history of this animal. And so if we know when the animal has stranded, for example, we can then assign an age to each of those growth layers going back in time. We can also estimate the body size and therefore annual growth rates because there's a really good relationship between the size of the humerus and the size of the turtle shell. And this is also how we age the turtles and it's based on counting and doing some other math to get the estimated age. All right, so now I'm gonna move into the different sea turtle species that you might see here off the coast. The first one is the olive ridley. So olive ridleys are found all over the world. They're usually very oceanic, pelagic animals, so they don't typically come too close to our shore. But if you're out on a boat, maybe out on your way to Catalina, you might see these turtles out in the water. They also do this amazing behavior where they nest in mass numbers. It's called an arribada. Um, as some of you have been to different parts of the world, you may have had a chance to witness this. I've never gotten to do it yet. I hope to one day, but it's really amazing. Now, I bring this up because I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we might use that skeletal chronology research I talked about. One of the main questions we always get is, how old that is that turtle? And when you're thinking about demography and structure and populations, we'd like to know how long it takes these turtles to reach reproductive re reproductive status, right? How long does it take till they become mature? And so if you're thinking about the average size of these turtles out on the beach, we did a study just this summer, and I had help from a wonderful uh, undergrad student this summer who was part of our NOAA Hauling Scholar program. This is Hassan Sheikh. He's actually just up the road at UC Irvine. And in the lab this summer, we processed a whole bunch of these bones. He handled a full 40 of them on his own, which was tremendous. Um, and this is what it looks like when they're in the lab. And the end results of all that analysis and lab work is you get this really cool picture now for all these different turtles of a given size or a range of size going up and down for a given age. So that's going across there. And you get a bunch of data that looks like this, and then you can apply that to say, OK, those turtles back on the nesting beach, if the average size was 62 centimeters, how long does it take that turtle to reach maturity? In this case, it's around 15, 16 years. So this is really valuable information for us when we are thinking about managing and looking at the population growth for these animals. All right, next up is the leatherback. These are massive turtles. They're huge, they're incredible. They're also very pelagic. They typically don't come very near to our shore. They are, though, actually the state marine reptile of California, and that's because they come all the way, yeah, you like the flag? <laughs> that's my favorite. They come all the way from their nesting beaches on the far west Atlantic, or, sorry, Pacific, um, off of Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and they come all the way over here to eat the jellyfish that you find off of California, Oregon, and Washington. I don't know what it is about those sea nettles, but that's what brings them all the way across the ocean. So to catch these turtles and study them, we have to use a lot more techniques. So in this instance, you're seeing us 
looking for the um, looking for the turtles from the plane up above. Then when the plane finds it, it'll guide the boat to go and find the turtle, and then we can bring the turtle up on, onto the boat, weigh them, measure them, tag them. Just this past year, we had a chance for the first time to deploy a drone to help us do this. Um, so the spotter plane is how we've always done it in the past. Moving forward, we're hoping to start to be able to use these drones. The technology and battery life still needs to catch up. But this is what a typical chase might look like from above. Hold on while the drone balances itself. And you can see that they kind of zoom in, get there as close as they can. This turtle, unfortunately, dives just at the last minute. So we missed this one. Um, but when we, here, we'll, we'll watch it swim the rest of the way. There it goes, smart turtle. When we do get them then up on shore, or sorry, up onto the boat, that's again when we can do all the sampling, measure them. We'll give them satellite transmitters so we can figure out where they go. We also can deploy these really neat suction cup uh, video cameras, basically, that let us then follow that turtle underwater to see what they're doing. And here's what they're doing. They're going after these amazing jellyfish. And if you look at the picture that's showing its mouth open, you see those things inside? Those are called papillae. It's their amazing adaptation. Not only does it protect them from not getting stung by the tentacles, but it keeps the jellies in their mouth so it doesn't come back out as they're going through and catching these incredible, huge. Yeah, I got to get there for that last one. Nice. <laughs> there we go. So. We have this beautiful video. It's an eight minute video. I don't have time to show it tonight, but check it out. It's a project that we did in cooperation with uh, the National Marine Sanctuaries, and it'll give you a lot more footage like that and tell you a really beautiful story of this uh, Pacific leatherback population. All right, species number three tonight is the loggerhead. This is a really cool population as well. They all nest all the way across the ocean in Japan. Um, that's where they're all from. This is now showing you a tag over 200 turtles that have been tagged at various points. And you'll see they've spent most of their time in the central North Pacific. But there are some of them that we know that come off the coast of North America. But what brings some of those turtles all the way over is still a huge mystery. We have no idea why they come over, feed off of red crabs off of Baja, sometimes show up off of Southern California Bight. So myself and folks at Stanford um, in Hawaii, in Japan, and in Mexico, we created this project recently. It's called Loggerhead Stretch, which stands for Sea Turtle Research Experiment on the Thermal Corridor Hypothesis. Basically, it's do they need a warm water bridge to come over to North America? So what we're doing, and this is the website, you guys can follow along now. We are in year one of a four-year project where we are deploying TAG, satellite transmitters, on 25 turtles. They then get a ride on a huge cargo ship out to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. They get lowered in their very own turtle basket and released. And so we're hoping over the next four years, the ocean will have different conditions and we'll get to see which ones come to North America, which ones go and stay in the central North Pacific, and why are they doing this? And so you can follow their tracks, this is live. They were deployed just in July. And one thing that's really neat that we know about these turtles from all those previous tracking studies is that they have a particular temperature that they like to go to. And so here you can see those tracks of those 25 turtles all and they just took off. They went north. They're trying to find that special magic spot where the temperature is just right, warm water, cold water meet. There's a lot of food for them to eat. And they started meandering around this area in early September. We are actually seeing loggerheads, though, off the coast of California. We've already had four sightings, I think it is, this year um, of loggerheads. So stay tuned. This might be a year where some of those turtles make it all the way to North America. Uh, jumping in real quick, if you recall, I mentioned there is that loggerhead closure area that can be triggered in these warm water events. NOAA has this great tool called total observation, sorry, temperature observations to avoid loggerheads. It's a live thing that is updated um, so that we can see what are the temperatures like and is the area open or closed. It is still uh, open right now. The water temperatures are not too warm. It's, it's not a problem right now. But if you look at this, the red is basically showing it where the water is much warmer than normal, and so it's kind of moving close to shore. So this is, again, another live tool that you can use and follow along to see what these conditions are like. All right, and finally, I'm going to end with the green sea turtles here, just give them a brief introduction, and then Andy and I are going to swap spots, and he's going to tell you much more about these turtles. So the turtles that we get here off of our coast are from this East Pacific population. They have main nesting sites in uh, Mexico at Michoacan, also in the Galapagos Islands. And then there are other nesting beaches. There's an insular group at Riviera Island and also in Costa Rica. 
This is where we do some of our in-water research. Again, we have our small boats. We have these special gill nets that allow us to capture the turtles. It doesn't hurt the turtles. We can bring them into the boat. And then we can, again, collect all the measurements and tags that we need, and then we let them go. And they go back into the water, and they keep that tag on. Our uh, tags will stay on anywhere from a year up to, I think we're pushing two to three years now, which is pretty great. And then we get this awesome information about where they go after they've left our field site. And so, for example, we uh, will get these tracks um, that will show us all those points are showing where this one turtle went in the period of about three months. And we're using that information to the help guide some of this aerial uh, surveys that we're starting to do. Again, we've only had a chance to deploy our, join, jo our drone at this site once before, but we went over an area where we were new with there were turtles. And sure enough, we saw at least one or two of these turtles on this day. And we're hoping to do some more of this starting next month. So that's kind of another exciting thing we're doing. And then last up for me today is to kind of just show you a little bit of what some of our research looks like that we do right here in, in the neighborhood at the Seal Beach National Wildlife Refuge. So it's a small little pond that we go and we use a small little boat, but we still catch these big turtles and we bring them up on shore. Here we're collecting a skin sample for genetic and isotope analysis. And then I just want to draw your attention to this little turtle that we uh, captured and tagged um, last August, so August of 2022. This turtle was just spotted last month in the Bolsa Chica Ecological Reserve with its satellite tag. And so this was pretty cool. This is the first time we've had our community sightings program see a turtle with a tag, let us know. And we do this work in partnership with the Navy, and they provided this map that, again, shows us the satellite tracks. All those little dots are where this turtle likes to hang out. You can see here's where it was tagged. It's been a lot of time in Huntington Harbor as well. And then it's been spotted over the last month or so in Bolsa Chica. So this is a final little shout out to if you see a turtle, please let us know. We do a sighting program for NOAA. Um, these are some, again, amazing photographs that we got. I believe the photographer, Doug, is in the audience right now. So thank you. This is our code. And there's a lot of other information that we can get from doing this, whether it's a photo identification, looking at what they eat. This is one of our turtles down in San Diego. We also get sightings of turtles in these really unusual areas, so off of the Santa Barbara Basin, out of the Channel Islands. And then, of course, right here, the Aquarium of the Pacific has a fantastic program that monitors the incredible turtles in the San Gabriel River that I just got to see for the first time today. So it's an amazing project. Thank you guys who have been involved in this before. And now I'm going to tag team and hand it over to Andy to take over part two. Yeah, so I'm going to pick up where Callie left off by going uh, deeper into the ecology of the most abundant species that we have here in California in general, and in particular in Southern California, the green sea turtle. And I'm going to guide this half of the talk with some really basic questions about green sea turtle ecology. And so let's start with where, where do they occur? Where might we see green turtles here in, in Southern California? Well, Callie already mentioned uh, two of our primary study sites for our team at NOAA and, and with our collaborators uh, here in Orange County, and then uh, a long-term site down in San Diego Bay that I'll go into more detail about in a little bit. But really, green turtles occur, they're essentially ubiquitous along our coastline, occurring in higher densities, typically further south, but you'll see them uh, in most any embayment, depending on the time of year and the conditions, uh, lagoons, but also outside of those protected waterways in open water sometimes and in areas such as the Channel Islands. So moving right along, where do these turtles come from? And Callie, again, she touched on this, but pretty much all of our turtles come from Mexico. So we do have inputs from other areas uh, further south or in the Pacific, out in Hawaii, but virtually all the turtles that we have in Southern California, to our knowledge, come from two uh, primary nesting beaches in Mexico. So they're laid as eggs there. They leave the beach as hatchlings. At some point, they reach the, a juvenile stage and show up in our habitats in Southern California. And then we have a mix of ages and sizes here in Southern California, where they're hanging out in our coastal areas and foraging. And then we have turtles that are reproductively mature and at that point, they'll make these reproductive migrations back to Mexico. Uh, another really basic 
question about green turtle ecology, but one that is really important to things like habitat management here in California, where they forage. What do they eat? Well, you may think of green turtles as herbivorous. They're famously presented as these macro herbivores, vegetarians of the sea. So they're commonly associated with seagrass, shown here. Uh, and also here, I believe this was taken in La Jolla, in San Diego. Uh, and also algae. So they have this, this reputation as vegetarians. And that's valid because uh, going back decades, it's been a primary diet item for green turtles. But really, the, the picture is a little bit more complicated. They're known to supplement diet with animal matter, primarily invertebrates, but in some cases, fish too. And they seem able to adapt to what's available in the local environment. Often anchoring diet, again, in, in uh, seagrass and algae, but they can supplement with, with animal matter. And so, given this ability to adapt to local conditions, it's important to, to uh, study diet in each context and each location with ongoing research. Uh, this is a different kind of question, a little bit more vague and broad, but how do, do turtles behave when we're not looking? It's kind of it's a, a funnier question, but I think Callie did a great job of surveying all these uh, different methods, some fancier than others, that we use to study green turtles, like GPS tracking and tissue sampling. But there's a whole host of other behaviors important to their management and our understanding of them that we really can't observe with those kinds of methods. And so I'm really using this to tee up a project that I want to share more with you about where over the last couple of years, we've been deploying a pop-off camera on green turtles uh, down at our study site in San Diego Bay to get a uh, green turtle's point of view on life. And I wanna share some results of that work with you and I'm gonna focus on those last two questions that I brought up, what do they eat? And again, how are they behaving when, when we can't observe them? And again, this, this work is occurring and has been occurring in San Diego Bay where we have a foraging population, different sized turtles, different age turtles. And this population has been studied for several decades dating back to the 70s. Uh, and the camera looks like this. We call it the CATS cam, which stands for Customized Animal Tracking Solutions. It's a company in Australia. And it has three suction cups that we use to attach it to the turtle. On board it has a camera that we use to record video and a host of other sensors that I won't really go into, but these include an accelerometer, a depth sensor, it can measure temperature, light availability, so it's a really cool and uh, fairly new technology available to us. When we attach it to a turtle, it looks like this. So there's one suction cup underneath out of view and the two on the arms in the front facing forward into the turtle's field of view. And we use a release mechanism with a set duration. Uh, so after a certain amount of time, the camera will pop off, the suction cups will flood, camera floats to the surface, and we get a GPS location for retrieval. So it's uh, nice, and, nice and easy for us. Well, I should say easier than it could be. Uh, and here's an example of us releasing a turtle with the camera attached, and you can see the suction cups hold, they're pretty strong, and they survive this, uh, this power stroking that the turtle does. And so I'm gonna share some footage with you that is actually collected from the camera. And first, let's focus on what they're eating. So here's, here's a foraging video. And first, I wanna point out this characteristic visibility in San Diego Bay. So a turtle's point of view really doesn't stretch very far. They're living in, kind of living in a cloud in a way. And this is a turtle foraging on seagrass. So the dominant seagrass in San Diego Bay and an important seagrass resource in California is eelgrass, Zostera marina. And we find that is a very common diet item. And this camera also allows us to see these kind of fine scale behaviors like this flipper swipe that we actually see quite a bit. Um, and give us an idea of not only what they're eating, but how they're eating it. Moving on, this turtle approaches a big clump of red algae, some red algae species. So they're eating both seagrass and algae. And 
She spends quite a bit of time. I'm showing you, I think, the first 13 seconds, and then I skip ahead 20 seconds, and she's still hoovering up this big clump of red algae. And those were just a couple foraging instances. If we sum up what we found over five deployments in 2022, I'm gonna show you that here. In terms of the percent of time that we observed turtles foraging on different items, and I'm gonna summarize it in terms of the three categories here, and unidentified organisms, so those things that we haven't been able to tell what they are from the video, there's quite a number of those instances, but then red algae and eelgrass. And you can see that Eelgrass forms the, the most important component of diet just from these five deployments, um, but red algae is also important, and then they're also likely consuming a bunch of animal matter. And I'll point out that when we see them, when we observe them foraging on algae and on seagrass, there's a lot of invertebrates that live within those uh, plant structures, within the algae, that we call epifauna, that are also being consumed. Um, and the video doesn't tell that story. And so I don't have time to go into too much depth, but I just want to make the point that our video uh, just adds to the, the large body of evidence suggesting that you know, seagrass, eelgrass here is really important, not only for green turtles, but for a host of other native species. And I'm just going to leave that thought there. And I'm going to move on to the second question, this, this vague question, is how do they behave when we aren't watching? Uh, there's this exploratory nature to this research that's, that's pretty exciting in that we deploy the camera, it pops off, we collect it, we download the video, and we never know what we're going to see. And we found some pretty surprising things. Uh, the main thing I wanted to communicate with you today is our turtles are quite social. And so this turtle sees another turtle and is clearly attracted to it and follows it for a while. And so our turtles are interacting with other, other turtles in San Diego Bay. We assume this is common where, wherever turtles aggregate, uh, and it's happening quite frequently. Here's another instance. Turtles have this face-to-face -face interaction on the sea floor, and I don't know if you caught that, but the other turtle is moving its mouth as as if it could be passing water for olfactory communication or maybe even making noises. We're not sure, but these are avenues that we'd like to pursue in the future. And here's a third instance where a turtle swims up to some sunken structure. Hopefully you can see that. Did I pause it? And it interacts with another turtle there. And there was actually a third turtle uh, out of view that I didn't show you. And so we think the turtles might have these, these kind of turtle meeting spots in San Diego Bay. Uh, and these were just three of many interactions that we've seen. So here I have one up, another instance. And the evidence just continues to build as we put out this camera. I particularly like these two stills on the left, the bottom left. Looks like that turtle might be checking out, what, what's that orange thing on your back? And so again, if we sum up interaction rates over seven, seven deployments, here I'm gonna show you, I standardize across deployments of different lengths, so I'm showing you a rate per 12 hours. And I'll also point out that we really only collect footage during the day. We turn off the camera at night, you can't see anything. And so th really these are daytime interaction rates, but nonetheless, we're seeing some variation, some turtles we didn't observe any interactions for, and you'd expect that. The camera's only out for something like 20 to 24 hours at a time. Um, but some of these turtles are interacting north of eight times in just a half day, so it seems to be quite the social, social crew. And at this point, the purpose remains unclear to us. Uh, we need to do follow-up research, but we wonder if there's potential for social structures, so like a social hierarchy, given these interactions, do these turtles know each other, uh, and a potential for communication. It seems pretty, pretty clear to us that turtles communicate in some way, but we, that's, that's honestly a black box in sea turtle ecology we know very little about. So I'm gonna wrap up the, that pop-off camera section and end up, end our talk today with this final question. I think it's a good place to end. How are our populations doing? How are things going for green turtles, our most abundant species in California? 
And you may have seen some recent news. If you haven't, check it out. Uh, Green Turtles have been in the news recently. Uh, things like they're making a comeback, and there's more and more sightings in our backyards. And these, are, these pieces of evidence are indicative that the population might be doing well. But I, I think uh, the, our data, our observations in San Diego Bay, and data from our collaborators in Mexico support this uh, idea that the population is growing. And the two main drivers are reductions in harvest, is the primary one, but also fisheries bycatch. That, and those two factors are allowing uh, survival to increase in older turtles, especially adult turtles, which will correspond and is correspond with more reproductive output at the primary beaches in Mexico. And we have uh, a time series of data from Mexico that really help us inspect this pattern more. How's the population doing? And we can go through time and see what's happened uh, in this case since 1965. So here I'm gonna show you number of nests at the biggest uh, green turtle nesting beach that we know of in Colola Beach, Michoacan, Mexico. So the, the y-axis is number of nests per year. And then on the x-axis, we're gonna go through time. So first, let's set some historical baseline back before we had data. Sea turtle harvesting has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, but much, much less harvesting before the 60s. And so let's set some baseline that is off the chart here. And then our first uh, estimates of the number of nests, which again we expect reflects the overall population status, come in 1965 and 1970. And then we had the beginning of monitoring on that beach in the 1980s, and they show this population crash uh, and near collapse. And this is associated with harvest. And so this picture is actually showing you primarily olive ridley harvest, although there are a couple green, picture, green turtles pictured. Um, and it was taken in 1967 in Mazatlan, Mexico. I think it does a good job of illustrating you this, the state of sea turtle harvest at that time, where the turtle business was booming. And our colleague estimated that harvesting in Baja was an order of magnitude greater uh, during the 60s and 70s than the 250 years before that. And so all of this harvest and this massive demand for turtle meat, for turtle shells, caused the population to collapse. But let's bring in some good news. Uh, starting in the 1970s, but really increasing in the 80s and 90s, we started seeing protections for turtle nesting habitats, and especially later in those uh, years, turtle foraging habitats. There are other things relevant here, like the Endangered Species Act being passed, and green turtles were listed uh, for the first time in 1978. But a huge turning point was when harvest was made illegal in Mexico in 1990. And so through the work of scientists and con conservationists, that was a massive breakthrough in uh, green turtle conservation. And so with these uh, advances in conservation, you would hope the population has responded, and it has. So our last couple of years, I say our, these data are from our colleagues, the last couple of years down at Kalola Beach and Michoacan are, have exceeded that 1965, that first data point. So maybe we're getting closer to some unknown historical baseline. And so what would we expect uh, based on this reproductive output down in Mexico? Well, we'd expect populations to increase in California and that our anecdotal evidence suggests that's happening, the news reports, but also our data in San Diego. So this, we're seeing more turtles, and then we might also expect to see more smaller turtles. So more hatchlings being produced, more juveniles showing up in our water, and we are seeing that. This is a cross section of the size distribution that we typically see in San Diego Bay, and we have seen a major uptick in these smaller turtles. And we've been seeing more turtles. So this is just an anecdote to reflect that. We set a program record from over 30 years of monitoring in San Diego Bay by catching 13 turtles in under two hours uh, back in April. And so that's just a massive amount of turtles for us and is indicative of the, the status of the population there. 
So you can see a number of larger turtles, especially in the foreground, and these are veterans that we've caught and re-caught in San Diego Bay over years, sometimes over decades. But you can also see, especially in the background, uh, some of those smaller turtles, the newer recruits uh, that are showing up in Southern California. So zooming out, just to put a, a brief bow on this, how are Southern California green turtles doing? Well, all indications are doing are, are that the population is increasing. And I'll also note that with climate change and changing ocean conditions, we might expect to see not only the population increase, but expand into habitats further north as habitat suitability changes in our urban, urban Southern California coastal areas. Uh, and in this context, how might you contribute? Callie already mentioned these, but I just wanted to mention them again. You can uh, participate through things like community science. So I wanted to plug the great work that the Southern California Sea Turtle Monitoring Project does here out of the Aquarium of the Pacific. And if you see a turtle, you can report it. And we have our NOAA Sea Turtle Sighting Survey. Here's another QR code if you're interested in, in uh, reporting a sighting. Um, and so those are, are great ways that you can engage in sea turtle conservation. Uh, some brief acknowledgments. I'm not going to read all these names, but I especially wanted to thank uh, the Aquarium of the Pacific for hosting us, in particular Adina Metz for, for organizing. And with that, I think I'm going to invite Callie back up here so we can both field questions. And as you think of your questions, uh, I'll leave you with one final video and just kind of leave it up while we take questions. This is, I think, a five-minute video or four and a half minutes. And it shows a turtle that swims up to what we think is a marker chain in San Diego Bay. And it uses it as a scratching post for over an hour. <laughs> and it, it kind of makes sense. It just feels good. It's, they're probably scratching off skin, exfoliation, maybe some keratin. But it gets one flipper, and then it kind of shifts. And it gets the other flipper. And then we think it's swimming away. But it's getting the, back, the hind flippers <laughs> with this like distinct rocking motion. And so just. Uh, another example of you never know what you're going to find when you put a camera on a turtle. Okay, when you take the photography like this and the camera releases, can you backtrack it and tell where they were on a GPS? Uh, where, do you know where that chain is, for instance? Can you go back and look at that video? We, th we think we do know where the chain is, but not from GPS. Uh, the, the camera, unfortunately, does not have a good GPS unit. Every now and then, we've put both the camera and a GPS tracker on a turtle, so we get coincident data. But unfortunately, no. We, we can't tie that to specific locations. Hi. Um, yeah, I was really, really interesting. That's, that was a really cool presentation. And my question was, I noticed you talked about how there was a lot of observed turtles coming from like Japan and Asia and Pacific over, over all the way to here, which was so surprising and <laughs> crazy how they can make it. But, um, they cross right across the Pacific, which is where supposed ocean gyre is with all the plastic. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, and you guys are you know, fitting them with cameras, um, but there was none with plastic, so I wonder if you found them with plastic. And the cameras that you're installing seems like they could get caught in more nets. So has that happened, or have you thought about that? Or, or how long do those trackers stay on? Because it just seems like a thing that I was thinking about. No, those are great questions. Um, let's see, a couple different things to address there. So I would say as far as the plastic ingestion side of your question, unfortunately, yeah, plastic is super common. It's the little stuff, the microplastics, that, that's basically what's in that like, you know, great Pacific garbage patch out there. But, and so 
you know, any turtle that we do a necropsy on, the dead stranded ones, right? Necropsy is basically like an autopsy, but for animals, you find plastic inside their stomachs. Um, sometimes, and I'd say it's usually those more near shore turtles, so not the ocean crossers, it's the local San Diego, or not San Diego, but local green turtles that, you know, might find the random plastic bag in its stomach or things like that. So it's definitely a problem um, becoming all too common. I can hopefully, us collectively as society, we're getting better at moving away from plastics. Um, as far as then the entanglement side of things for the satellite tags, um, I don't think it's ever been a real issue. I don't think I've ever seen a turtle. I don't think there are enough tags out there to maybe know for sure. I've never witnessed it. I'm not aware of it. And again, these tags go on these satellite transmitters. I'm talking about going turtles from programs all around the world. And it's never been a huge issue. And also thanks to technology, right? Those tags are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of the main thing. Do you have anything else? To yeah, add? with regard to like a uh, suction cup camera, mm -hmm. those things we don't leave on very long, like a day, maybe two. For leatherbacks, we're not sure how far they're going to swim, so often that's shorter than a day. We're just trying to catch, catch uh, take some foraging video mm -hmm. and have it not be too far from the boat to collect it later in the day. So it's less of a, an issue when we're doing the camera work. That's mm -hmm. usually just shorter duration, uh, staying closer to where we work in California. Yeah. But definitely things to be aware of. Yeah, that absolutely. You're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. okay. How long have you been discovering these turtles? That's a good question. So I started working with NOAA in 2008 as part of my graduate studies. Um, so I've been doing that since 2008, so that's a while. Before I went to grad school, I, like I said, I worked in an aquarium and I was actually, I would stand in front of a group like this and we had a, uh, a preserved sea turtle and I would present to uh, education classes, right? Schools would come to our aquarium, do that, and I would have my turtle and I'd have the plastic bag, right, that looks like a jellyfish underwater. And so I was working with turtles in that way for a few years before then. Um, and then before that, I just thought they were awesome. I thought they were cool. So maybe my whole life I've been studying them, I don't know, but with Noah since 2008. How about you? I think I did my first sea turtle research about 10 years ago. Yeah, so 10 years. And to answer the question from a slightly different angle, we've been seeing, I think, the first reports of green turtles in San Diego Bay mm. go back to the 1970s. So people have known that there are sea turtles here for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These guys are ancient animals, right? Hundreds of millions of years they've been on this planet. It's pretty cool. Good. I see somebody way up top, too. I'm not sure. Hi there. Oh, there we uh, go. Thank Good. you for the presentation. It was great. I'm a local boat captain here in the harbor, so I'm on the waters every day, and I see these turtles quite a bit, which has led me to come here tonight to learn more about it. Love it. Um, lately, the past year, I've seen way more than before, but a couple times recently, I've seen these turtles that are much bigger. Uh, they look to me like 100 pounds or 100, like two to three feet long. Uh, are those all green turtles? Likely, yeah. In the inshore waters like that, uh, it's highly likely that they're green turtles. Can't say for sure without a photo. But yeah, green turtles yeah. are reproductive adults, exceed a meter in carapace length. So if you add the tail and the head to that, it's well over yeah. a meter. I feel like their heads look bigger than mine when they pop out. Yeah, <laughs> when they get big, they do. They have the little guys, it's like the little little head, and then the big adult ones, it's like a basketball or something. Yeah, Very cool. yeah. we've got some cool other sighting tools that can kind of help you figure out what kind of turtle is it. So like Olive Ridley's are a really common one that you might see offshore. Their flippers compared to their body are much shorter than like the green turtle. So that's another good trick. And then these logger heads, definitely if you see those off the shore, please, I hope you got that. that sighting to survey yeah. those guys I tend to look very orange they have a very orange just kind of like orange pine cones we call them if you see them out there so a couple little tricks thank you so much all right, right over here. not sure who's next yeah. is there a good place to see turtles in the waters around long beach like in alamitos bay or down by the breakwater mm. want to jump on that 
not particularly. <laughs> not. So as we saw, yeah. like there are the turtles right there in San Gabriel River. That's been a pretty incredible site. The Aquarium of the Pacific, again, does an incredible job kind of monitoring that site, keeping aware of it. Um, but we get sightings in all the harbors. Again, these satellite tags are showing them coming into the channels. They're kind of everywhere right now. And I think the best thing is like having patience Right, wait for that little head to kind of pop up, break the surface. If it's really quiet, you're out in the morning, you can kind of hear their little breath when they're doing that. Um, or tag along with somebody else who's seen one of these guys. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question here. Um, you gave us a thought to ponder on the seagrass and the, the turtles eating that. Um, it's okay, I'm over here. <laughs> I'm not bored. Gotcha. Just, um, I was curious, do you study the seagrass and is that changing or is, do you see, like, are we affecting that in any way? Um, and that's it. We don't do a lot of research specifically on the seagrass, but we collaborate with people do, mm -hmm. that do and, and we monitor. I'm thinking about we use San Diego Bay, that's our most well-monitored site mm -hmm. as an index. Seagrass there is actually doing quite well. It's, uh, seagrass, eelgrass is sensitive to things like water quality, uh, chemistry, mm -hmm. temperature, uh, but the conditions in San Diego Bay seem uh, to be supporting yeah, healthy seagrasses. I can speak to it less uh, north of there. Um, yeah, there's some evidence that although the extent of seagrass is increasing, maybe the, the actual quality of like the blades and the shoots and the density is decreasing. So these are things that we're working with people uh, to monitor. But yeah, I don't have a, a better answer for you right now. Uh, pardon me if I'm just misinformed, but I thought it was generally accepted that sea turtles are pretty solitary. So uh, my question to you is because that tracker looked kind of big, you know, it's like a big old orange thing on its back. How much of those social, social interactions could be driven by the fact that that tag is on there? Could it be going up to another sea turtle like, hey, can you help me out? Or, or what's that big old orange thing on your back, you know? Um, and then sorry to ask, Two questions, but my friend here is dying to know, did you ever get any footage of these sea turtles being attacked by a predator like a shark? Thanks. Yeah, so that's a great, a great point is we can't rule that out. So we're putting out the camera. It's by default, our method brings in the possibility that the camera is attracting other turtles or generating interest. But we're confident that most of these interactions are natural and that's corroborated by some observations in other places like the San Gabriel River where we see turtles in high densities and they seem to be interacting uh, and no, no camera involved. And then fortunately we haven't observed any predation and so so far at least with the the camera that I was talking about we've only deployed it in San Diego Bay where there are little to no predators and so we haven't observed that yet. Um, you were talking about nesting sites and how once they're more adolescent, they move up here. So once they reach uh, reproductive age, do they go down and then come back up again? Or do they stay back down in Mexico? Good question. I love that. Those, those are my kind of questions about age and where do you go and where are you moving around? So for our green turtles, they typically, to the best of our knowledge, right, they uh, will find a foraging area and kind of settle in and they become residents. And again, this is because we've seen turtles for 20, 30 years that come back. We see them when they're smaller on the juvenile side. We see them as they get big. And it's about every two to three years is our best guess again that they go back down, they do their breeding, nesting, and then they come back to their foraging areas. Then you've got the other ones like the loggerheads. So those guys only are in the central North Pacific and over on our side of the East Pacific. Pacific, um, while they're juveniles. Once they become reproductively mature, they go back to the Western Pacific and they stay there. They eat around Japan, East China Sea, things like that. So they don't come back as adults. The leatherbacks then, they do this trip every three years. Um, that, again, to the best of our knowledge, every two, three years, maybe it's longer than that because we haven't seen that many this year. Um, but yeah, each species a little, is a little different and why they evolve that way is still a huge mystery. 
Um, up here. Up here. Corner. <laughs> up here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you guys said that uh, it, like the sea turtles have been monitored since like 1970, and that you guys have seen some like repeat sea turtles in over decades and years. What's the most amount of times you've seen the same sea turtle, and how long did it live to, or like how long is it if it's still alive? Yeah, that's a great question. Multiple yeah, uh, captures. I know. I feel like we looked at this data recently, so I think we're trying to find like if we can remember. There was a 1990 turtle this year. Right? Yeah, a, a couple at least. Yeah, captured well over, well over 10 times. I yeah. think 15. Yeah, easily. Yeah. And the oldest turtle that I've done the skeletal chronology on, it's harder to age age them using the bones as they get older, but we think she was well over probably well over 60 years old. And she was one of the first turtles that we had captured. We, the people who started the program, but collectively Noah had captured in 1990 and she was one of the first ones. She unfortunately died in 2014, but she was a big, long lived, awesome turtle that we've seen. And there's a lot of them out there, males and females. It's pretty neat to see. Okay, thank you very much. Good, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So just to wrap it up, afterwards, um, you come down here and you go out uh, the ground floor and there's, I think there's beer and wine. Best of all, there's Adina's Art Projects, which are always a treat for conversation. And you could talk to our speakers more in depth and learn more about it. I did want to mention that um, two things. One is, is the next first Wednesday on November 1st is going to be on dolphins and dolphin communication. So that should be a pretty good one. And uh, also that um, Cassandra Davis is here. And if you heard, uh, she'll, she'll be hanging out out there. But she's in charge of our community science programs. And you can maybe find out how to get involved with them. And she also uh, came up and whispered in my ear that the place you can go see the turtles is at Los Ritos wetland and the turtle truck. Okay, so thanks again for a terrific talk and enjoy the art and enjoy the conversation.